Thank you, Brandon. Yes, for, thank for you for having me. Joining. Um, as I say, um, President for uh, Energy Industries at ABB. Um, you oversee the delivery of solutions and services that digitize, automate, and electrify industry to ensure a safer, smarter, and more sustainable use of resources across oil and gas, power, water, chemicals, and life science sectors. Quite a remit, 18 years um, across leadership positions at ABB um, and a leader in the industry. So thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you. It's fantastic to be here back uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, ABB's participated and so great to be part of the thought leadership that happens around the event. Brilliant. And a pleasure to have you with us. Um, continuing the theme, I should say, of uh, the morning so far, we'll have audience participation later in the session. So um, as we go through, feel free to pop your questions into Slido and we'll see to uh, what we can what we can come to. Um, Let's look at the last years. As you said, you've, you've been with us a, a, a few years at these events now, but in the last year alone, kind of with regards to decarboning, decarbonizing operations, I should say, um, what would you point to as some of the most consequential developments? I mean, I think, you know, the investment in, in clean tech is two times that of fossil fuels in 2024. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a big turning point, obviously. The, a lot of that's renewables, a, a big contribution, obviously, from China. Uh, on solar and wind and these sort of things, but it's great to see that that investment has now, uh, you know, kind of overtaken the traditional industries or the fossil fuel side. So I think that that's a, a big deal. Uh, we see in the U.S. where emissions have come down. Uh, so you know, three countries: China, India, uh, China, U.S., and India. Mm -hmm. uh, contribute roughly 50% of the emissions footprint in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, China increased emissions uh, last year. India increased emissions last year. The U.S. decreased emissions last year. So I think that's positive movement, I would yeah. say, at least in the U.S. side. Now, I think we have to also pay a little bit of attention to the details of the numbers, because in the U.S., for example, our carbon footprint is two and a half times that of a person in China or a person in Europe, eight yeah. times that of a person in India. And so while we've come down some in the U.S., I think it's still, there's still a lot of behaviors that we have to look at ourselves. The panel earlier was talking about the customer backwards, mm -hmm. uh, looking at it, or their consumer backwards. And so I think that's certainly something important for us to look at as well mm -hmm. as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, looking at, at the customer, if we just stay on that for a moment, in your conversations with um, those customers, how have business kind of challenges and, uh, changed and priorities changed um, over the last year? Yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting ride, I guess, the last couple of years uh, with everything that's gone on. But if you look at the discussion with customers now, trying to get projects to actually be shovel ready and go, I think, is the big thing. So we've gone from kind of hypotheticals and these sort of things to a more pragmatic approach, I think, and mm -hmm. looking at where can we have progress. And, and so we use the line a lot in ABB that we're pursuing progress, not perfection. And I think that's really the discussion that's happened with a lot of our customers now is, hey, can we take some of these projects forward? We've got to get a, a past just piloting some of the technology and these sort of things and get to uh, applications at scale. And I think you're starting to see that now with some of the projects going forward and the IRA, uh, Green Deal, these kind of carrots and sticks things that are happening around the world. You're starting to see now that some of those are actually resulting in shovels in the ground. Okay. Okay, um, and I like that, that idea, pro progress rather than um, perfection. perfection. Yeah. Um, obviously, you service customers all over the globe. Um, so can you just, yeah, for the room, I guess, give us a, a global perspective um, on how the energy transition can be delivered equitably? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, a real challenge. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're a European company based out of Switzerland, and so the discussions that you're going to have sitting in Switzerland or the Nordics uh, is a lot different than the discussion you're going to have sitting in India or Pakistan or Indonesia and these sort of places. So what kind of fuel sources are available? What's the cost of those fuel sources? Uh, because everyone's entitled to energy and clean water. Uh, we still have a billion people in the world that are in energy poverty. Mm. And, uh, and so it's a very different picture. Uh, of what that looks like. And so the discussions that we have at ABB are very much focused on meeting the markets where they are. We're not trying to pick a winner on technology and say we're only gonna support this kind of technology. Uh, and so I, I think that's really important that you meet the markets where they are. The overall goal is less emissions into the sky. Mm. And I think that's really the focus. So we, lots of discussions around carbon capture and does that enable fossil fuels to continue to develop, you know, I think carbon capture is a necessary tool for us to reduce emissions. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so at the end of the day, um, energy consumption follows GDP. So as GDP grows around the world, and especially in developing parts of the world, uh, the amount of energy they need 
increases. Well, how can we do that with the lowest carbon footprint? And that's a lot of different sources. It's not, uh, it's not one or the other. So kind of an and equation is what we talk about at ABB a lot, that it's, it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, interesting, you, you mentioned carbon capture specifically uh, in some of the talks yesterday and, and the report that we've just recently released shows, yeah, as I say, that carbon capture year just in the last 12 months has grown massive in terms of investment sentiment and we predict to continue growth over the next three years. But um, going back to just that global perspective, I'm, I'm interested to know whilst policy regimes of course vary around the world, um, to ensure a timely and, and a credible transition, what would your ask be to um, global policymakers around the world? Yeah, it's a difficult ask, but I think we need some stability. Um, you know, there's 70 plus elections happening around the world this year. I think about half of those have already happened. Mm -hmm. There's one in the US. I don't know if you've heard anything about it. Um, but I, I think that the, we need some stability in policy. If you look at the customers, some of the customers that were sitting on the stage in the panel before, OMV or Repsol or, or different customers, these uh, companies are investing with a 20 year, 30 year plus horizon, time horizon. Policy changing all the time has a significant impact on that. And so for companies with big balance sheets or healthy balance sheets, IOCs and NOCs and these sort of things, it's one type of discussion. When you talk about private equity and, and startups and these sort of things, I mean, imagine if you had no idea what the, what the time horizon was gonna be for you know, the current incentives that are in place. Mm -hmm. um, carbon tax or, or, or carbon credits, uh, the carbon markets exist it covers about 25% of the global emissions. The prices range from $6 a ton to $185 a ton. Uh, and so it's very, very difficult to, uh, to place a bet, to make something bankable, to drive these projects forward uh, around the world if we don't have some consistency. Again, it's one sky that everything is going into. Very good. Um, yeah, let's, let's leave the election question there and move to another. Um, <laughs> yeah, an, another I'll give that one to the audience. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's, there's another question that comes up linked to this, right? In terms of like, who, who pays for this? So uh, this afternoon we have, um, yeah, as I say, our green economy stage will explore all of this in more detail, but it is a fundamental question for us to explore. Um, what's your take when it comes to ultimately who pays for everything that we're, we're talking about over these two days? I mean, look, we do uh, at the end of the day. So uh, whether it's tax dollars that, uh, that are collected and done as, as stimulus or, or you know, uh, incentive schemes and all these sort of things, uh, at the end of the day, governments get money from tax revenue. Uh, that comes from all of us and our businesses and everything else. And so the consumer has a, has a role to play in this. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I got an electric car about a year ago. Uh, and part of the reason to get that electric car was to be part of the discussion. So it's easy to sit up here and talk about what doesn't work with EV or charging networks or infrastructure or this and that and whatever else if you don't have a car. If you have an electric car, I think you have a different seat at the table. And so it's on all of us as, as the consumers, we have to pay for it. Okay. Um, and I don't think that we should confuse that, uh, of that it's gonna come for free or a real popular consensus always is to have someone else do it. Uh, and I think that's where we, especially sitting here in the U.S., have to look at our consumption habits uh, and different things as individuals because uh, we play a big role. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, on a similar thread, you're obviously working with customers all the time who are balancing their need to decarbonize whilst also delivering financial returns. So maybe you could share some, some lessons learned from that or some perspectives on, on how companies are approaching that and how they're doing it well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the big balance, obviously. I mean, I, I work for a public company, so we have shareholders to answer to, and they have expectations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, capital will go where the greatest returns are. And, uh, and so we have to work on scaling these technologies. That's a big focus that we have with the customer base uh, around the world is, hey, how do we get these technologies, uh, prove that they're uh, reliable, dependable, can be done efficiently and safe, uh, and then how do we scale them? So a big thing that we're doing from an ABB standpoint is we're investing in companies around the world. Um, we've done about 28 investments across the last several years into technology companies that we think have potential to really have an impact on our industry. Um, again, everybody goes after EVs because it's kind of the lowest hanging fruit. That's only 12% of the, the global emissions footprint. Mm. And that's if you addressed every car in the world. There's a billion and a quarter cars on the road, roughly. Uh, in 2030, we'll maybe be at 30 million EVs a year. 
that are that are being sold and and uh, hitting the roads. So that's a uh, that that solution takes a long time to play out. What we're trying to look at from ABV's standpoint is how can we help on industrial processes, on power generation, thermal processes, these sort of things, in order to have a real impact. And so some of the investments that we're making. Uh, one is in a company like Coolbrook, uh, if you haven't heard of them. They're on the uh, electric heating side or on the thermal processes side, and they're electrifying things. And so um, someone talked on a panel earlier about electrify everything that you can. That's mm. definitely the lowest hanging fruit. Mm. Um, another cool question that I saw earlier uh, on, uh, on the Slido or, or whatever the polling system is that you're using was who's not in this room that should be. And I think that's an important topic to have. I mean, we need the people across the entire value chain. So the mining guys, mm. it's really important that we have them in the room mm. and part of the discussions with you all and others. Because if you want to electrify everything, you need a lot of copper. Uh, and uh, our ore qualities are going down. Uh, getting a new mine online is a 10 to 15 year process. Uh, and so we can talk about electrify everything, but you have to get up in the value chain further. And so I think having some of those discussions uh, with other companies in the room is super important mm -hmm. so that we can really have that impact. But again, back to your question, I mean, the discussion we're having with customers is trying to balance those investments of short term and long term. Okay. When we invest in one of these technology companies, we're not expecting a return in a year. Okay. Okay. Um You've almost teed me up perfectly just to remind folks there's a, there's a critical minerals discussion later in, in, in this oh, room. Perfect. We'll, perfect. we'll, we'll so talk they are about some of that. So, um, but no, I mean, going back to the technologies piece, um, you mentioned already around kind of the electrify everything. Um, we were also talking with Petter. He mentioned SMRs, yep. hydrogen. He mentioned uh, storage as a key piece. And then we had Greg Jackson as well talking around, as you've just said, kind of this time imperative. Um, so, so what technologies do you think specifically uh, have the opportunity or the potential to revolutionize the way we generate, distribute, um, and, and, and use energy over this short to, to medium term? I think you have to kind of put it in two buckets. Uh, one of the panelists earlier also talked about there's a lot of solutions that are available today. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, almost 50% of the electricity generated in the world goes through an electric motor, uh, which is not a stat that many people know. If you use high efficiency motors, if you attach drives to motors, uh, you can reduce, obviously, the energy consumption a lot. You could put 10% capacity back on the grid. So the gentleman uh, was talking earlier from NextEra, I think, uh, Petter mm -hmm. was talking earlier from NextEra about how long it takes to bring new loads, especially renewables, onto the grid and kind of what the backup is and what's the process for that. Well, we can, get, we can pick up 10% by changing out some equipment uh, and using technology that's available today. And so the first step, I would say, is, uh, you know, we always say the greenest unit of energy is the one you don't consume. And, uh, and I think that's a really important point, that we, we can't just walk past the efficiency gains because they exist out there now and we can capitalize on them. So I think that's really important. Then you get into what I was talking about on kind of the electric heating, the thermal processes. You know, 40 plus percent of the emissions footprint comes from those sort of uh, things that are happening in hard to abate industries. And uh, hydrogen, I think, has a play. Um, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, blending into those hard to abate sectors in, in uh, oil and gas and some, in steel making, these kind of things, I think hydrogen has a real play there to help lower the carbon footprint of doing those things. And again, lower emissions, net additions. That's our theme. Okay. Okay. Um, an interesting question, actually. I think we can potentially sure. draw ourselves to, to this one here. Um, maybe that second one on the screen, one thing we haven't talked about too much so far people. today is, is the people side of it, right? Yeah. So we've talked a lot about technology. Um, what are, I guess, the two um, or three competencies you look for in, in candidates coming to, to join you at ABP? Yeah, so I think it's a really important topic to touch on the people side. Uh, you know, there was a period there where everyone thought that robots are going to replace everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you look at the countries that have the highest density of robotics, they have the lowest unemployment. Uh, and so it, it's not that they've replaced the worker, so to speak, it's that the worker does something different. Now we're having the same discussion about AI uh, and is, what's that going to do and what's that going to replace and, and all these sort of things. And I don't think it's going to replace you know, anything. I think it changes what the worker does. And so I think uh, if you look at two or three core competencies, I think the ability to adapt is really important. Mm -hmm. If you look across the last several years, all the challenges that we've had, how we've had to pivot businesses, supply chains, uh, redesign equipment, all sorts of challenges that we've had across the last four years. 
uh, it's all been done by people. And uh, the ability to adapt and, uh, and to adjust kind of what we're working on or what we're developing, I think is critically important. Second thing for me is collaboration. You, you have to have that in your DNA. Um, I, I say all the time at, at ABB and to my team, uh, if you don't have collaboration in your DNA, you should have your CV ready because you're going to have a great opportunity to work somewhere else. <laughs> uh, and I, I think it's really important, and especially in the environment that we're in now, because no one company can do it all. No one company has the technology, the funds, the people, access to piloting or testing things, all these sort of things. And so we have to collaborate across this industry to speed up the decarbonization. Mm -hmm. So I would say those are probably two things that I think are, are really important. Okay. Okay. Um, this actually next question I think flows really nicely from it in terms of then um, that, that team that team you look after or the wider business. How do we roll out a kind of an, innovo an innovation first mindset across organizations, which I know is is, is a key key part of ABB? Yeah, it's really important. I mean, in my in my current role, uh, you know, we've got about eighty five hundred people that are part of the organization. Uh, I'll step into a different role at ABB. Uh, on August 1st, and we'll have 20,000 people that are part of that organization. So embedding innovation into our, our uh, company from top to bottom, critically important. We're a technology company, so you know, we look hard at how much are we selling of new innovation, of new products that we're releasing to the market. Big pushes in digital, in mm -hmm. automation, and these sort of things, which were talked about on the panel earlier. And so I think it starts from the top of kind of setting the direction uh, for the company of uh, what's important to us. Being allowed to have a safe environment to fail, mm -hmm. uh, critically important because everything's not going to work. Uh, we've got some digital solutions that we've rolled out that we thought were fantastic, and they didn't work uh, the way that we wanted them to. Or we've developed subsea drive technology uh, in order to help uh, oil companies electrify things on the subsea, and we probably got to that market a little bit too early. And so we've had to pull back on those things. Failure happens, uh, and it's got to be part of the equation. And I think that kind of mindset starts from the top. So I think those are a couple of things that I think are important for embedding innovation and kind of that, that mindset. The only other thing I would say on the, on the people side, which kind of uh, dovetails in, is I think it's really important that we recruit the younger generation to our industries across this room. Mm -hmm. um, there's always interest to go to other parts of, of industry or you know, IT or, or different technology companies and these kind of things. We have got to get the people uh, that are coming out of school now interested in our industry uh, because they need to have a seat at the table to solve the problems, not just complain about the problems that exist. Absolutely. Um, it's surprising this one hasn't come up already in any of our, our Q&A, but potentially that, that second one. I, I like the first one, but I might save that one for the last question. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's forward looking. Um, generative AI and the role in, in the transition, how are you uh, assessing that? Yeah, look, I think everybody's trying to figure out uh, AI and how to use it. You know, we all have to obviously be careful with it in many ways because there's a lot of proprietary information inside of our companies uh, and that can get out. Uh, and, uh, and so that's something that's obviously of high interest to everybody probably in the room. Uh, we're using AI now um, a lot uh, on the engineering side, on the finance side, uh, trying to get efficiency. So most of what we're doing now inside of ABB is around efficiency gains uh, from either on the engineering side or application side or finance side, data uh, consolidation, these kind of things. Um, I think certainly generative AI will have an impact. Uh, what's, it, what's the impact that it's going to have? I mean, let's see. Uh, obviously, right now, the impact that all the AI is having is huge demand on the power grids, uh, which is what was talked about earlier. And again, that means we need more energy, net additions. How do we do it? With a lower footprint, so net additions and lower emissions. That's what, completely what we're focused on at ABB. Okay, okay. Um, I think we've got time for, for, for probably two more, so maybe let's go to the bottom one, because um, it touches on some conversations from earlier around speed. So how do we balance, especially in a global context, the need for speed and then challenges equally around inclusion, stakeholder engagement, community engagement, um, and I could extend that to, to other things that take time and hinder our speed. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I mean, this is, uh, this is the, the number one challenge that sits in front of all of us. I think this is where we have to demand speed, uh, I think, from all sides, whether that's permitting, regulatory, uh, the financing side of things, uh, the technology, piloting it, getting it off the ground, scaling it, moving forward. We have to push faster. Um, you know, we can't have yesterday's technology tomorrow. It's not going to get us to where we need to be. 
And so I think it's really important that we push for speed. The stakeholder engagement, you know, we live in the communities that we serve. And uh, so I think it's also our obligation uh, to really engage in those communities and be part of the solution. Um, you know, we're working on a project right now that we just announced with Topso, who's also a participant uh, here, uh, together with Topso and Floor, uh, and they're building an electrolyzer plant in, uh, in Virginia. And I was, I was just with that customer uh, two months or two months ago or so in Denmark, and they're building it in my hometown, uh, where I grew up uh, outside of Richmond, Virginia. And so I said, what a cool thing to be a part of. Energy transition, jobs on the ground, which is what was being talked about earlier, uh, clean tech, investment that's happening, IRA dollars that are being spent. It's all, it's, it's real. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly an optimist and glass half full, but I think if we commit to the communities that we serve, we can help speed things up. Okay, okay. Um, let's look ahead then. A um, couple of minutes left just to, to close us out. What trends um, or trend uh, in the effects uh, to decarbonize industry give us grounds for optimism that net zero by 2050 is, is still in reach? Yeah, look, I think it's I think it's challenging, and we can argue what what's the what's the degrees. You know, is it one and a half? Is it less? Is it more? All that sort of stuff. We have to ch pursue uh, relentlessly progress, and I, I think that's what's most important. Electrify everything that we can. We got to get upstream on the value chain, but electrify everything that we can. Critically important. Uh, using technology that's available today to pick up efficiency gains. Don't walk past money that's there for the taking. Uh, and a lower carbon footprint that's there for the taking now. Uh, and I think that's a really important message to people. Uh, and, and so I think those are a couple things that leave me optimistic that, uh, that we will ha continue to have a significant impact. The spend is double what it is in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. The carbon footprint is coming down in, in the US. Uh, we need to work on it other places uh, in order for that same thing to happen. Um, and all of us have a responsibility uh, to consume less. Uh, quite honestly. And I think we should start by looking in the mirror of what can we do to consume less. Okay. Okay. Brilliant way to end. Uh, Brandon Spencer, thank you. Thank you guys very much.